Thanks, Caroline. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So indeed, in this session, um, we're going to take a look at a whirlwind tour of API business models. Okay, there are 30 minutes and we're going to cover 20 models. And you, you sort of segued there, but for the last eight years, I've been focused on the world of APIs, first with Program Web, now with API Science. And we've seen 10,000 APIs, right? Program Web's almost about hit 10,000 in that directory. And so we get asked a lot of questions, a lot of questions about APIs, whether it's business questions, technology questions. You know, and you would think the classic ones are, uh, you know, REST versus SOAP and JSON versus XML or, you know, uh, what are the big trends? But I'll tell you what the biggest, the question we got asked most often was, how are people making money with this stuff? You know, what should my business model be? Am I giving away the milk for free? These are the class of questions that at Program Web we got asked the most. So, without further ado, I think I tend to answer that question when somebody comes to me and say, what should my business model be for my API? My, my answer to that question is another question. My answer is, why? why? Why is it that you have, why do you want to have an API or why do you have an API? And so here's a bunch of good reasons. Right? So I think everybody in this room either has an API or is thinking about having an API. And you have probably one or more of these as the strategic objective as to why do I have an API, right? Um, but, and you know, in this 30 minutes I'll talk about what I think are some secrets, some things about APIs that people don't really talk about enough. And so the first one is that an API strategy, which are those things that we just looked at on this slide, are, these are not API business models, right? These are objectives. This is why I'm gonna have an API. So don't confuse a strategy with a business model. And I think this why question is the first question to think about before you start positing what should my API business model be. The second question is who? The who question's about who is my API for, right? This is a product, I'm gonna have a consumer of this product so who is that? And I think if you look today in our sort of relatively young industry, we've kind of for now settled on this is what the who's look like in the API marketplace in terms of it's either my, I'm a consumer of my own API, so it's me, it's my company, or it's my customers and partners, or farther out it's everybody else, right? It's the open API program. Um, but, and then you know, internal, private, open, or public, right? So th I think that's a very good way to sort of think about the who question. But again, this is very important to your business model because your business model and, and who are very intertwined. And then the third question is, before you start thinking about the business model, is what? You know, what the hell is it that I'm selling? Why, why do I even have an API in the first place? And what is it that I'm selling? What's the service? What's the data? What, am, what you know, you can have the most beautifully designed REST API and developers will shrug if there's not something of value behind it that they're getting access to. It can also be that you have lots of things that you can offer access to from your organization, but you also have to decide sort of what it is you're gonna start with, right? Because particularly with API programs, you might have a whole laundry list of things you might wanna have, but you're gonna have to pick some to start with. So, and I think this is sort of secret number two. APIs only succeed if they offer something of value, and I put value in quotes because it depends. So here, I'm gonna give you half a dozen examples of valuable things that have APIs that are successful. Um, now, coming shortly after me, we have Twilio up on the, on the stage here, but right, one of my favorite APIs of all time is Twilio, valuable service, cloud communications, right? Um, valuable data. You know what one of the most searched phrases is on program web itself so is weather. Developers love weather APIs, so valuable data, weather. Um, valuable audience, right? So here are three very valuable sets of audiences. Um, all these things, of course, have APIs. Um, valuable functionality, right? Enterprise functionality and over half of all the transactions that go into Salesforce come from the APIs, not from the web app, right? So it's a very valuable piece of what Salesforce has to offer. Valuable market, right? So access to eBay, whether you're putting things into eBay or getting things out of eBay, the APIs give you a way to do that. Um, and then last but not least is valuable access, right? I mean, you don't just sort of waltz in and get access to the airline traffic schedules, right? That doesn't happen, right? So there's something that you can get access to through an API, but Again, it's control. So the preface here is that you need to answer these questions about why, who, and what before you should really doing the, the how question, right? What's my business model gonna be? So the business model, there are um, 
I'll give you the history, what I think of as the history of business models for APIs in two slides. The first being um, 2005, right? So back in 2005, a few things happened. Those of you who sort of don't remember those early days of the API universe, um, that's when the Google Maps API came out. That's when Housing Maps, the phrase web mashup was born in 2005, right? So it's kind of considered the birth of the, this sort of class of APIs is 2005. And in the program web started, in those days, these were, I think, the four core business models, right? There was free, developer pays, developer gets paid, and then this other sort of other bucket called indirect. And if you fast forward to 2013, what do you get? You get a much uh, richer, pun intended, set of API business models, right? It's, you know, here's the 20, right? And I think a couple of things, you, I don't expect, maybe in the front row you can't read it either, we'll go through all these in more detail, so if you can't see these, don't worry. Uh, but at the top, there are a couple of things I want to call out here, maybe three things. First of all, that there's free developer pay, same ones at the top. So the same ones from 2005, I think, still fundamentally apply today. Um, it's just that we've figured out, as an industry, more ways to monetize, to get a return on our investment for APIs as you sort of walk across this spectrum. And I think there's a bit of a story there in the sense of it goes from people assume that it's free, uh, but as you can see in this diagram, that's just a tiny piece of the puzzle, right? There's so much more that's not free. Um, and then you come over to indirect, and so, so we'll walk through all this. And, the, and I think the second thing I wanted to call out was, you might be tempted to go, well, okay, where am I, where is my organization, or where is my API, should it be, is it in that diagram, and try and find one of the sort of nodes on this matrix to say, that's what we did. Um, why do I say that? I say that because I think that's secret number four, which is most APIs, certainly most successful APIs, have more than a single way in which they achieve their return on investment, right? Everybody in this room knows that it costs money to build, provision, support, evangelize. APIs are not free to build and support. So therefore, if you're gonna make that case as to why am I gonna have an API, you need to have, I think it helps to have that ammunition of a set of reasons why, right? So I might be using it for internal. Some of those going back to that sort of why slide you know, n number of those, a number of those will then give you that ROI. So think about it as we go through these 20 business models, which combinations make sense. So free, um, we all know free. And Facebook has done pretty well with free, right? They've done okay with that. They, but but the, that, if you go back again to the question of why do they even have an API, they have it because they want to be the web social operating system, right? They want to be ubiquitous. Uh, and so the API and having a free API, and Zuckerberg had said at one point they thought about having paid access to their API, but then they decided strategically against it. Uh, but the reason you can log in everywhere with Facebook and get that data from everywhere as a developer, that fits their strategy, right? So free makes sense for them. Um, one other free one I call out here is really um, all the Gov APIs, for example, all the public APIs from, from the government sector. Those are all, there's a few hundred of those at this point, and they're all essentially free but that's free because that's effectively their mandate, right? Now, second part of the story is developer pays. I think this is, again, going from, from left to right in the sort of types of APIs, what you sort of think of them to where you might think less of. So developer pays, here are five examples, right? Pay as you go, tiered, freemium, unit-based, and transaction fee. These are all different types of developer or partner or consumer of your API is paying to get access to that API. And I, we'll go through examples of each of these. Now, I don't think anybody in this room doesn't know about Amazon Web Services. Uh, and to my mind, this is the quintessential paid API, right? It's pay as you go. Um, and what I'm showing you here, just like that's a snippet of the EC2 pricing page. And then if, it's a very long page, a lot of text on it, a lot of, description, but what two sentences they start with, they start with this. This is what Amazon wants you to know at the very top of their page. They say, pay only for what you use, there is no minimum fee, right? So out of the 10,000 words of text on that page, these they consider to be the two most important points, and that's true for their entire AWS platform, right? That it's pay by the drink, as Bezos calls it, um, and this, uh, to my mind, embodies pay as you go, right? So that's a paid model. Another paid model that isn't necessarily a shock to anyone, right? Tiered pricing, right? This is bulk pricing for APIs. Um, 
MailChimp, right? So it's showing you this is their pricing page. And if you go from left to right, you see that you pay less as you send more emails per month from MailChimp. So this down here, it says you can start with 9.95 and then go up to 40 cents an email once you go over uh, a million emails a month, right? So there's not, you know, no shock there, but again, the API is reflecting the fundamental business model of MailChimp. Freemium, another one that we're all familiar with as a general concept. But when you think about applying that general concept to APIs, and, and I, don't, I don't, very small to print here, don't worry about not seeing any of that print. Here's the Google Maps, there's Maps API and then the business version of the Maps API. And in a classic sort of freemium sense, you see more check marks on the right hand side, right? The thing that you're paying more for has more features. So part of the freemium strategy is, okay, what is it? For them, um, you know, I'm gonna get service level of agreement. I'm gonna get a technical contact. I'm gonna get a bunch of things when I'm paying more for that API. So part of the question about, you know, is API business models is maybe what do I offer at that free level and then what is it that I'm giving value on top of that? And that can be, in this case, it's two tiers, but it could be you know, four, right? Classic pipe pricing matrix. And what if you combine those two, right? So you take freemium plus tiered pricing, and going back to that MailChimp example, right, they do both. And then we see that a lot. There's a lot of this sort of where you're gonna have some free tier and then you're gonna have tiered pricing above that. This is a very common model. Now how many, I like to sort of check, how many of you know what unit-based pricing is? Three people, four people. It's about on average, that's a lot for a room. Uh, there's, so unit-based pricing is an edge case. So this is an edge case where you might use this, so here's Sprint, where you have different API calls or different data that you want to charge a different price for um, and then rationalize. So here's Sprint, what they do is they have, so here they have over here, 20,000 credits cost you 100 bucks and then you spend those credits on API calls. So for example, an SMS call costs you four credits to make, whereas a location-based service call is gonna cost you six, right? So that's just how they, so you buy the bulk of credits, then you spend them on your individual API calls. And just another example, uh, WordStream, which is a uh, keyword optimization tool, they also have a, and they call them, I think they call, they call them units, they have a unit-based pricing model where you buy you know, X amount, right? It's like tickets at the fair, right? And, uh, but like so many things in life, you can get carried away. Um, so here's an example of what I think is carried away with pricing. This is, by, this is if you wanna use SMS from Orange, this is about a quarter of their pricing page. Right, I couldn't fit it all on one big slide, but this is the pricing matrix for SMS from Orange. I mean, a lot of this geo stuff, but nonetheless, just be careful about, right? Still, simplicity matters a lot here. Uh, and you know, speaking of simplicity, if you look here, transaction fee, this is the fifth of the uh, developer pays business models I wanna talk about. Uh, all of the, now when you see this, you go, oh yeah, okay, I understand what the transaction fee part is. Well, we all understand that this is the business model for payment gateways, payment APIs, right? So it makes complete sense that, oh, they're gonna charge me a percentage of that transaction, right? So these APIs are simply reflecting the underlying business model of the core business. Um, but also simplicity-wise, Stripe came in a couple years ago. A, they did an awesome job with a fantastic API. They really catered to developers. They did a whole bunch of things right, just like Twilio. And they also had a very simple pricing model, right? So they didn't do the orange thing, right? They really thought about how we're gonna digest this into something which is just bare bones, simple, easy to understand, and I can get going both technically and from a business perspective to kind of just get that ball rolling, right? I'm gonna be up on Stripe in no time. So those are the developer pays ones. Now, developer gets paid. And I think now we're moving to the ones that are sort of less obvious. So um, if you look, anybody in this room who comes from an e-commerce background or an online advertising background would recognize some of these, so we've got a fair number of them here. You recognize these terminology, right? So like RevShare, affiliate program, CPA, CPC, these are all terminology that for the most part come from the worlds of e-commerce and advertising. Um, so we'll dive into a few of these, but these are interesting sort of, and often can be seen as a bit of a win-win model, right? So because the developer makes money, you make money. So. To my mind, this is a classic example, right? Amazon has had that affiliate program for probably a decade or more, right? Where you get an affiliate code, you can put it on your blog, and when somebody clicks through that, you get a percentage, right? So the, down below here is the percentage that you get when somebody, 
and it's CPA, which is cost per action, right? So somebody goes through and buys a product based upon having clicked through your affiliate code, you get that commission, right? And it varies. But what they did, which was really smart, is that they took that already existing model from the web and just applied that to their API, right? So they just baked, they sort of took that model, put it right into the API and it fit naturally. And there's no, uh, there's no rate limiting, right? So as a good sort of symptom of doing a good job, they don't worry about rate limiting it because they'd love for you to make more calls. And as a developer, as a partner, you want to make more calls because that means you must be doing something right, right? Because you're both making money in this case. Now, the other part of that is CPC, which is uh, cost per click. So here is shopping.com. And there's their, their partner program page. And there is the API. And often you'll find, right, API programs that are somewhere under partner programs as well, right? So there's the API program and a couple of websites that use the shopping.com API, right? So this is different in the Amazon one in, in as much as at Amazon, somebody clicks through and they have to actually, the action is they have to buy a product, right? Whereas here, if somebody clicks from your site or your app that you built using this API, you get some fraction of a penny every time somebody clicks through to the destination site, right? So those are the two different ways. But literally, I think almost every single shopping app you use on your phone, like, you know, those red scanner ones and so on, and you get to do product comparison, you know, a big part of how those apps make money and websites make money is by using these APIs and then getting that click-through revenue. Uh, you know, that's their monetization strategy. And you can think, oh, well, that's, that's money from my blog. That doesn't really add up to much, right? Um, but it can add up to a lot. So here's Expedia. Their affiliate network is about a $2 billion a year business. And 90% of that $2 billion is API-driven traffic. Right, so it's not just pennies from the blog, right? There's a much bigger business at work here. So here's a billion dollar API business, um, which happens to be, in this particular case, built off of affiliate money. And the last of this uh, class of API, right, where it's sort of this developer gets paid model is um, RDO. So RDO is a subscription streaming music service. You sign up, you get sort of the uh, monthly as a customer. And what they've done is interesting, right? So they took their API and again, matched to what they, their a, matched their API business model to what they do. Because what they want you to do is they want you to sign up and stay on as an evergreen customer, right? They want you to keep every month after month be an RDO customer. So the API incentivizes that because what they do is they give you a recurring commission. So as opposed to the CPA and CPC, those are effectively one-time commission. Here you get a recurring revenue and it, how much you get as a third-party developer varies based upon what that customer had signed up for, right? So again, what they've done is, I think, and it comes back to this sort of, secret, in this case, secret number five, which is how do I, how do you bake your business model into your API? Because think about those examples we just saw. Those are just completely nicely meshed match of their fundamental business model of what they're having their API do for them. Um, so baking your business model to your API, I think, is a very important principle to, to live by, so to speak. And you know, following that story of going from free, which is obvious, and developer pays, which is fairly straightforward, and some of these sort of edge cases, which of the uh, developer gets paid. Now, if you think about this whole indirect one, this is a much bigger, and if you go back to that initial slide that I showed you, breaking down all these 20 API models, business models, um, this is actually the widest one, it's the biggest one. But yet at the same time, it's the one that gets talked about the least. Yet to my mind, it's probably the, in many ways, the most important one. Um, it's not small for no reason. Um, so we'll talk about these, but you can see there's sort of a couple related to content, there's a couple related to SaaS and the cloud. And then there's this little tiny one about internal use over here and the ways in which you can use your API and get that ROI for yourself you know, internal, right? So content acquisition, and people don't often necessarily think about APIs in this way, but I think these are two good examples of content acquisition. Um, eBay, right, I sort of alluded to that before, but they get, I don't know what the exact stat is, 60 plus or minus percent of all the items on eBay got up there through the API, so that's the whole uploading and power seller tools. Every power seller tool out there uses the eBay API to get stuff up on the marketplace, right? And there it is, almost $7 billion back in 2008 of merchandise got up on eBay through the API. So it was very important to, to eBay. Um, 
And then you have Twitter, of course. Um, regardless of all the machinations with their API program, the fact of the matter is, is that even with iOS 7, which was, of course, announced new phones today, you'll be able to tweet from your phone, right? So that operating system, iOS 7, as do all the operating systems, allow you to tweet into that third-party API, right? It's basically an API under the covers. It's, just a, it's this whole movement where we're not going to talk about APIs anymore at some point in the future because we're develop software that way. But here's content acquisition for Twitter, which you can still do through their API because they want tweets, right? So it's a huge part of that strategy. The flip side of that is content syndication, right? You have the New York Times. A lot of the media companies have APIs now. And it's not that they didn't do content syndication before. It's just that an API enables that in a much more fluid way. You might be able to have a broader reach, better biz dev, uh, better integration, less technical support. So an API can take models that had existed in the old days and give you a whole new both delivery mechanism and business mechanism to make that happen in a more efficient way, right? So here's the New York Times version of that, right? So the, the two sides of content. Um, APIs in the cloud. Um, I was at the CloudBeat conference yesterday and there was a whole bunch of talk about APIs in the cloud. And I think this is a good example here where uh, APIs can be a, an upsell to your cloud SaaS service. I talked earlier about how much API traffic Salesforce does. Salesforce doesn't charge you, they don't make you pay by the drink for every API call that you make to Salesforce because their business model is selling seats, right? They make money by selling seat licenses and they'd love for you to buy the most expensive seat license. So in this matrix, you go up one, two, three, four levels before you get integration via web services API, right? So you're at the $125 seat level on Salesforce. So is that charging you for the API? Not really, right? It's an indirect model, but yet it's important. It gives you a reason to, as, as a customer, to upgrade to a more expensive model. We see this. It's not just Salesforce that does this. We see a lot of cloud and SaaS companies use a model that's a variation of this. And it's not, you know, it's not a bad idea, it works well. Um, as a matter of fact, if you haven't, I encourage you to check out, uh, if you haven't seen the Small Business Web before, this is a trade association of SaaS companies that primarily targets SMB market, but also go larger. But they all have APIs. So to be part of the Small Business Web organization, you need to have an API. And part of the reason that this organization exists is because they've all seen how valuable it is to them as enterprises to have an API which allows, in particular, cloud-to-cloud, service-to-service integration. And I love this old quote from a couple of years ago with Sunir Shah when he was at FreshBooks, where he said, if we find that if our customers use any single integration, right? so first of all, integration is code word for API, right? but they're integrating the FreshBooks accounting software with maybe MailChimp for sending emails, um, they are three times more likely to convert to paid, right? So going, you know, when they try that service out, they're much more likely, because it's already a customer that kind of, A, they're comfortable with the cloud, and B, they like the idea that they can integrate these cloud services together to improve their workflow. Um, and you think about it, naturally, there's also going to be a stickiness factor. So you're, once you've done these sorts of integrations and you're using a couple of cloud services that work well together, you're also much, it's, you know, it's like the modern equivalent to some extent of the old giant ERP integration where God forbid you had to change that old enterprise integration stuff because it's just a big project, right? This is a minor version of it, but nonetheless, it, it you know, helps the customer because I can integrate stuff together. On the other hand, it also makes it stickier for the provider. And if you sort of just to sort of take one step back and think about what the stuff I've covered so far, you know, direct, right? As Amazon Web Services, pay as you, know, pay as you go. Uh, Expedia, MailChimp, Salesforce, all API business models, and whether you're using one or more, I think exist on this continuum from very direct to very indirect. Uh, we haven't talked about Netflix yet, but I will in a second. And I know Daniel talked about that earlier. Um, and there's no one sort of fundamentally right place to be. You know, it's, it exists, depends on sort of what you do. But I think it's useful to think about it as a continuum. And, you know, I think it leads to the secret that it's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, it's not, this is my business model. Um, and the last part of, again, the indirect, going back to that diagram, the last part of what I think are the important indirect business models are the uh, internal use case. Eating your own dog food, using your own API for your own stuff. 
And these days, certainly if we're at web, we saw this almost every time we talked to an API provider, we said, why do you have an API? In the last couple of years, I can't remember only one or two cases where the answer wasn't part of it anyway, well, for a mobile strategy, you know, for our own app. We got an iPad app, Android app, you know, all that sort of stuff. And here's an example from a couple of years ago where Net NPR, uh, this is their API traffic, and those purple ones are when they release their iPhone, iPad, Android apps, uh, but using their own API, right? So they were dog fooding, using their own stuff, and this is where they got a lot of the ROI from. They weren't trying to monetize the API, they were simply using it for themselves. You all know Evernote, and they have a very successful API. They actually have a very successful external third-party API program, although this chart wouldn't give that away. But because all of their apps, primarily mobile apps, use their API, look at that. Who's using their API the most? Well, they are, right? Look at that pie chart. There's barely a slice for the external usage, right? Um, and again, that's a great case where it's mobile-driven, the new client server, right? API is the new client server. And I think last but not least in this group, again, is, is Netflix, where you know, how, the, how the hell are you going to support a thousand devices without having some sort of platform strategy, right? It makes complete sense. And they don't necessarily even have to focus on anybody else other than themselves because they get so much value for themselves by having this platform strategy. And they can do all sorts of stuff that helps them because they, that is certainly the who, right? Who is using this API? Going back to those early questions, well, it, for Netflix, the answer is, us. It's us and our partners and our device partners and how we're going to drive these billions of API calls per day through our platform. Um, and so I think, you know, just to sort of wrap up here, I think it's the internal use case that might be the, the biggest of all of the use cases. And I think in many ways it's the least obvious. So there you go. 20. We made it. There's a couple minutes to spare. We got to 20 models in 30 minutes. And I, you know, I love to talk about this stuff. We don't really have, probably have time for Q&A right now, but uh, I'll be around all day, so if you want to talk about this, I, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks.